It's my delight to introduce uh, Laura Chomiak for today's colloquium speaker. Uh, Laura got her bachelor's degree from Wesleyan University in astronomy and physics and her PhD in astronomy from University of Wisconsin-Madison. After this, she was a Jansky Fellow, uh, but spent much of her Jansky Fellowship at the CFA. Uh, so this is a virtual homecoming, so to speak, for Laura to our institute. And uh, started in 2013 as a professor at Michigan State University, where among other things, she studies various stellar explosions and high energy phenomena, but also runs the local uh, Michigan State University and apparently has like 20 bachelor students or something at a time doing student projects with them and things like that. So um, I'm very excited to listen to her talk on a shocking shift in paradigm for classical novae. So uh, take it away, Laura. Thanks, Yvette. And I'm very happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. And before I get started, I would like to just uh, give a big shout out to my, my wonderful collaborators, many of whom are listed here. In particular, I'd like to mention Elias Eide, um, who is a postdoc who's been uh, instrumental in a lot of this work and is on the job market this year. And also I would like to uh, say that if anything that I talk about today is interesting and you'd like to know more, you can check out this brand new annual review that I wrote with Brian Metzger and Ken Shen uh, talking about shocks and Novi and a lot of the themes we'll be discussing today. Okay, so to kick off, let's talk about what a nova is, so we can make sure we're all on the same page. So novae take place in binary stars, where one of the objects is a white dwarf and the other is a non-degenerate star, typically a main sequence star, but sometimes a subgiant or a giant star. And this companion star transfers material onto the white dwarf, and that accreted material accumulates on the surface of the white dwarf. As that accreted material rains down onto the white dwarf surface, it gets hotter and denser and higher pressure at the base of the accreted layer. Until a nova is born in the form of a thermonuclear runaway. So when the critical temperature is reached at the base of that accreted layer, explosive CNO cycle reactions take place. And this leads to a rapid and dramatic increase in luminosity of the Nova system. The thermonuclear runaway injects a bunch of energy into the accreted layer, which then puffs up, expands, it engulfs the binary and is finally mostly ejected from the white dwarf surface. So some statistics for typical Nova eruptions is that they typically eject somewhere in the range of 10 to the minus three to 10 to the minus seven solar masses of material at a few thousand kilometers per second. And so if you do the math on the kinetic energy, the explosion has something like 10 to the 45 ergs of kinetic energy in it. So it's about a millionth of a supernova. But novae are about a thousand times more common than supernovae. We think that about 35 go off each year in our Milky Way, of which we observe about 10. We're still not perfect at discovering them all. An important thing to note about novae is that, is that they are non-terminal explosions. So the binary remains intact. After the nova, the white dwarf is th still there, the companion st star is still there and accretion will resume onto the white dwarf. And that hydrogen rich skin will gradually be re-accreted. And therefore we think that all novae recur, but the recurrence times can vary dramatically across novae depending on the white dwarf mass and the accretion rate. So novae may repeat on timescales ranging anywhere from one year to uh, almost a billion years. And so the picture I just described to you was pieced together over much of the 20th century with uh, a lot of really uh, important luminaries from that century contributing. I'd like to specifically call out Harvard's own Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin, who contributed a huge amount to our picture of what we understand about the physics of Novi. And Cecilia and many other folks over that century found plenty of reasons to study Novi. Because they're so common, they tend to be nearby, which means that we can spatially resolve them and actually image the ejecta. And they tend to be bright, which means we can study them all the way across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. 
it became clear that NOVI are also wonderful laboratories for studying most of the important processes in stellar astrophysics, like accretion, thermonuclear reactions, mass loss, and even common envelope physics. NOVI also occur on accreting white dwarfs, and so the implication is that they're, like, they're important for understanding the progenitors of type 1a supernovae. And I should say that in the last decade, popular opinion has largely turned against NOVI as being the primary source or uh, progenitor of type 1a supernovae, but we still think that they might be relevant in a minority of cases. And we also think that they can contribute a huge amount to, to our understanding of how white dwarfs can gain mass and actually retain that mass to grow. So in the last few decades of the 20th century, we also developed a story explaining the multi-wavelength emission observed from NOVI. So, so the picture we piece together is that after the thermonuclear runaway, the white dwarf sustains nuclear burning on its surface at, the, at near the Eddington luminosity. So it's actually, actually the luminosity set by the Pachinsky core mass luminosity relationship. But so it's approximately the Eddington luminosity. Um, which is about 10 to 38 ergs per second for a one solar mass white dwarf. And this residual nuclear burning can continue for days to years after the thermonuclear runaway, depending on the white dwarf mass and details of mass loss during the eruption. So during this time, the NOVA has a near constant bolometric luminosity, which at first comes out in the optical band. Oh, and let, let me make sure you can actually see my mouse. There we go. Can you see my mouse? Hopefully, yes. So it first comes out, out in the optical band when the ejecta are dense and optically thick and kind of like a red giant envelope. But as the ejecta expand and drop in density, the photosphere recedes through the ejecta until the hot white dwarf itself becomes visible as a source of soft X-rays. So you can see here, the X-rays pick up later. So here's a very quick and silly cartoon illustrating the expanding ejecta that reveal a hot white dwarf in their center. So, right, I want you to, the standard picture of NOVI is that it's a constant luminosity, but the emissions start out in the optical and then they shift to being bluer or actually in the X ray. So, this particular case that I've pictured here is V339 Dell, which exploded in 2013. And it is a pretty well-behaved poster child for this picture of a constant luminosity. Looks like it has roughly constant luminosity during the first 200 days. So right at, at the beginning, it shows a simple decline in its optical flux, but at that same time, the X-rays are increasing in luminosity. And then the X-rays are kind of constant in luminosity until sometime around day two, 200. It looks like the luminosity really started to drop while this is the SWIFT telescope in this particular case was in solar conjunction. So sometime around here, the nuclear burning on the white dwarf surface turned off, we think. And then the NOVA just sort of fades into obscurity. Its whole volumetric luminosity drops with time. And so that is the picture that we had pieced together. Um, but it's worth noting that it's always been clear that not all NOVI are so well behaved as V339DEL. Uh, this is highlighted by the fact that we often can't even explain the longest standing observable about NOVI, which is their optical light curves, kind of the most fundamental observ observation you could imagine. So this is an example of just uh, three NOVA light curves in the optical band. And you can see that they show quite a zoo of befuddling features. Some NOVI are bright for months, sort of rise to maximum and then stay around maximum for months. While they're at that maximum, they can show these flares or jitters. This one, the jitters, you know, vary over like a couple week time scales, whereas in this Nova, they're on a much faster time scale. Sometimes we see oscillations. And so there's really a huge amount of complexity in the optical light curves of NOVI that we really don't understand. And that standard picture of constant luminosity, pretty simple mass ejection cannot explain. And so when we said, you know, for the last several decades that we really understand NOVI, we have a good picture for them. We were really sweeping a lot under the rug. 
How much we still have to learn about NOVI became undeniably clear about a decade ago when we started detecting classical NOVI with the Large Area Telescope on the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. So these are uh, gamma rays at GeV energies. Here we have pictures of the first four NOVA detections in Fermi LAC data, and they were discovered between 2010 and 2013. And they were some of the biggest surprises of the Fermi mission to date. <clears throat> It had long been predicted that NOV should emit radioactive lines at MEV gamma rays, and we actually still haven't detected those. Those were the gamma rays that people had expected to detect and waited for decades. We haven't detected the MEV gamma ray lines, but we did detect this GEV gamma ray continuum that nobody was expecting. <clears throat> but now GEV gamma ray detections of NOVI are becoming routine, and we've detected 20 to date. So uh, that's about 20 in the last 10 years. So we detect roughly two novi every year in gamma rays. And here are Fermi light curves for the first 14 novi that we detected with Fermi lat. And day zero on this plot is the time of the NOVA's optical maximum. So you'll see that the gamma rays typically turn on sometime around optical maximum, and they last between roughly a week and a month after optical maximum. So these detections of GEV gamma rays from classical NOVI are surprising because to get GEV gamma rays, it requires the presence of significant non-thermal particles in the NOVA. So you have, the NOVA has to have some way to accelerate particles up to relativistic speeds. And that in turn implies the presence of energetic shocks, which are the generally understood mechanism for accelerating particles to relativistic speeds. So the process of diffusive shock acceleration transfers some fraction of the shock's energy into uh, this non-thermal tail of the particle energy distribution. So here is the gamma ray spectrum, the Fermi lat gamma ray spectrum for Nova V5856 SAG, which exploded in 2016 and is one of the highest signal to noise Fermi detections that we've gotten to date. The spectrum can be fit with either leptonic models where the relativ relativistic particles are electrons and positrons, which you can see on the left, or hadronic models where the relativistic particles are ions. And both generally provide acceptable fits, although the hadronic model is slightly better and requires slightly less fine tuning. So we generally prefer it for reasons I can explain in the questions if you'd like to know. Uh, but if, for my friends who care about high energy spectra, uh, most gamma ray spectra can be fit with a power law that has an index of close to two. Sometimes the gamma ray spectra require a high energy cutoff. So in this particular well-observed case, it's best fit by a cutoff at six GeV. But sometimes the gamma ray data are consistent with that power law extending all the way to the highest energies in the Fermi lat band. And of interest at the CFA, where I know there's a significant Veritas presence, is that NOVI have now become the latest and greatest uh, class of TEV gamma rays. So finally, we've detected them in the TEV band. Just a couple months ago, uh, Hess detected the recurrent NOVA RSO. And uh, there's only been a couple of astronomers' telegrams. There's not a lot of details out yet, so I'm not gonna talk about it much in this talk, but that's interesting and exciting. All right, so we see that gamma ray luminosities for no, so from this plot, we, uh, right, we took the gamma ray fluxes and combined them with our best guesses at distances for the NOVI to get luminosity. And we see that their luminosities are typically in the range of 10 to the 35 to 10 to the 36 ergs per second in the gamma ray band. And in this plot, um, Fermi non-detections are marked as downward facing error arrows and Fermi detections are black circles. We also see this telltale increase in gamma ray luminosity with distance, which implies that the Fermi lab observations are sensitivity limited. And that implies that there are a lot more novi with lower gamma ray luminosities that are just hiding below the sensitivity thresholds of Fermi. And if we could go deeper, we'd be able to check them. Okay, so 
NOVI are now routinely detected as sources of GEV gamma ray emission. And we know this implies significant acceleration of relativistic particles and significant energy and shocks. So where do they, we think these shocks are coming from? Where do we think they're occurring? The first NOVA ever detected in gamma rays was V407 SIG, which was in 2010. And this system was notable because it had a luminous Myra giant companion. And so in this case, we explain the gamma rays with a shock similar to what a lot of the people in the audience might be used to thinking about in the case of a supernova. So we think that, that the, uh, the giant companion ejected a dense wind into the circumbinary environment. And then when the nova went off and threw its ejecta into space, that ejecta crashed into the, the companion wind and there was interaction. And that's what gave you the gamma rays. So in this particular case, it's an external shock with circumbinary material. But in the, mass, in the vast majority of other novae that have been detected in gamma rays, the companion is a main sequence star in a cataclysmic variable. And in this case, we think the mass transfer proceeds by a Roche lobe over, overflow. So it should be relatively conservative. Main sequence stars do not drive significant winds and cataclysmic variables are known to have low density circumstellar material around them. So it's unlikely that the shocks that we're seeing in gamma rays are external with circumbinary material. So where do we think the shock interaction could be taking place for Novi with main sequence companions? This question was at least partially answered by this Nova, V959 MON, which exploded in 2012. It was a gamma ray detected Nova, which went off relatively nearby and we obtained high quality radio imaging for it. So here is a VLA image of it from about 120 days after eruption. And the color scale here marks 35 gigahertz emission, tracing the warm ionized ejecta. And you'll see that the ejecta are, appear to be bipolar. They're brighter at the top and at the bottom. We also have superimposed these black contours, which are lower frequency emission traced by the European VLBI network. And very long baseline interferometric observations can only pick up very high surface brightness emission, which means it has to be synchrotron radiation. So therefore these black contours trace the location of relativistic electrons relative to the warm ejecta that is showing you where the bulk of the ejecta mass are. And we interpret this image as synchrotron knots sort of hugging the um, outer edges of that bipolar thermal ejecta. And then we re-image V959MON about two years later, and we see that the thermal emission has flipped by 90 degrees. So rather than being brighter at bottom and top the way it was on day 120, and as can be seen here in the black contours, it's now brighter at left and right. So the picture that we came up with to, to uh, explain all this is shown here. The bulk of the Nova envelope puffs up and the orbital motion of the binary may help shape it so it expands preferentially in the orbital plane. The continued nuclear burning on the white dwarf powers a fast wind, which likely starts off relatively spherical, but is funneled by the equatorial torus into a bipolar outflow. So you can see that starting to emerge on the top and bottom here. This fast wind crashes into the slower equatorial torus and shocks ensue. So it's the interaction between these two distinct phases of material, that slower equatorial torus and that faster, more spherical wind that give you the radio synchrotron emission and the gamma rays. If you think such a bipolar morphology looks familiar, you'd be right. The same basic physics likely occurs in many diverse outflows shaped by binary orbits. And our model for Novi that I just described is inspired by the interacting winds model of planetary nebulae, which explains beautiful images like this scene here on left. And a nearly identical model has even been proposed for something as trendy as Kilonovi. Here on the right, you see a picture of a, of a cartoon picture of a Kilonova where there's a dense equatorial red torus and a faster bluer wind expanding more spherically. 
One of the interesting implications of Nova shocks being internal to the ejecta is that they should be very dense. So about 10 orders of magnitude denser than what we typically see in supernova remnants or radio supernovae. So although the ejecta masses in novae are low, the expansion velocities also tend to be low and the shocks tend to happen pretty early in the eruption. So, what the, so when you piece all that together, you <clears throat> it means that there hasn't been much time for the ejected to expand and the conditions are still very dense. And of course, such high densities imply short cooling times. And this can be confirmed in simulations of shocks that have NOVA appropriate parameters, like this one done by Elad Steinberg and Brian Metzger, where they showed that much of the shocked gas in a NOVA-like shock is not at 10 to the seven Kelvin, as you might expect for an adiabatic shock, but instead cools to 10 to the, cools or maybe even never reaches in the first place uh, at those temperatures. Um, so most of the gas is actually dwelling at something like 10 to the four Kelvin or even below. The implication is that the gamma ray producing shocks in Novi are radiative. If you believe Brian's back of the envelope calculations for what the conditions in this, the shocks should be. And of course, this means that the shock luminosity, all the energy in the shock should be radiated from the NOVA rather than being lost to adiabatic cooling. So if this is true, if the shocks are dense and radiative, then we would expect there to see significant luminosity coming out from the shock. So Brian Metzger and our theorist friends predicted that the shocks in NOVA are radiative. And we sought out to test this hypothesis because I'm primarily an observer. And Brian pointed out that the gamma ray luminosities observed in Novi are actually surprisingly high compared to the bolometric luminosities of Novi. So I'll just walk you through the math a little bit. It's simple. So if the gamma ray luminosities of Novi are something like 10 to the 35 to 10 to the 36 ergs per second, and a typical Nova bolometric luminosity is something like 10 to the 38 ergs per second. And again, remember, this is set by the Eddington luminosity of that white dwarf, right? We're operating in this model where nuclear fusion on the white dwarf surface is what's powering the luminosity of the Nova eruption. So that's where that 10 to the 38 ergs per second comes from. So then if that's true, right, the gamma rays are something like 0.1 to 1% of all of the luminosity coming from the NOVA. And that is large, that is a large fraction because models of particle acceleration at shocks imply that not more than 10% of the shock luminosity will be transferred to relativistic particles. And quite possibly that real number is an order of magnitude or more lower. So it's quite possible that it's more like 1% or less. And only about 20% of the energy in relativistic particles is typically transferred to gamma ray photons, which would be able to leave the system and be detected by Fermi. So when you put that together, the implication is that the total luminosity in the shock has to be at least 50 times higher than the luminosity in gamma rays. So if we multiply the measured gamma ray luminosities by a factor of 50 or more, they then imply shock luminosities in the range of 10 to the 37 to 10 to the 38 ergs per second. And this implies that the shock luminosity is comparable to the bolometric luminosity of the NOVA or the Eddington luminosity of the white dwarf, which is typically, again, 10 to the 38 ergs per second. So the shocks that produce the gamma rays are therefore likely to be energetically important and they may significantly shape what we observe in NOVA eruptions. As I've already discussed, we think the shocks are radiative, which means that the energy should come out as radiation rather than being lost to the system by adiabatic expansion. So do we see such shock luminosity? Can we test Brian's prediction? In 2016, the NOVA V5856 SAG, this is that same high, high signal to noise one I showed you the spectrum for, it was a good one. It provided a hint as to this question by showing correlated variations between the optical light curve, which is shown here in blue, and the GEV gamma ray light curve, which is shown here in black. And we thought we saw that they peaked together 
and they declined together and they even had this dip here together. So if the optical and the gamma rays are correlated temporally, the implication is that they have a common source. And we know that the gamma rays have to originate in shocks. So therefore that would imply that the optical emission also has a significant source in shocks. The optical emission is also produced in shocks. At the same time, as we were observing correlated optical and gamma ray emission in V5856-SAG, we did not detect it in X-rays. And this is pretty common actually for NOVI that we detect with Fermi. While they're being detected in gamma rays, we don't see them in X-rays. So therefore, a consistent picture emerges that any X-rays that are produced in the shock are likely absorbed by the dense ejecta and they're reprocessed into optical emission. Another opportunity to test this hypothesis of whether or not the optical emission is powered by shocks came in 2018 with this NOVA V5906 car. Its optical light curve was observed with stunning precision and cadence thanks to the bright constellation of satellites. It's B-R-I-T-E. And they produced this light curve. And we see that is one of our troublemaker NOVA light curves where the NOVA remains bright around maximum for more than a month and it shows these maxima, or the multiple flares, many of which show that the NOVA optical brightness increases by almost a factor of two in just a day or so, and then drops back down. So these flares are just the sort of thing that we weren't able to explain in optical light curves typically. And this is the Fermi lat light curve of this NOVA. So unfortunately, Fermi was down for the first few weeks of the eruption due to a solar panel issue. But when it came back online, it became clear that there were gamma ray flares at the same time as the optical flares. And the timing of these actually uh, mat match up remarkably well. They're consistent. They're, they're simultaneous with, within at least like six hours to better than six hours. So remarkably simultaneous flares in both optical and gamma ray. So I think this is very strong evidence that a significant fraction of the optical luminosity is indeed caused by shocks. It's also an indication that a lot of the features in NOVA optical light curves that we have failed to explain for so long, for more than a century, may indeed be caused by shocks. So I think V5906 car provides strong evidence that the NOVA bolometric luminosity can be dominated by shock interaction rather than by radiation from the hot white dwarf. Which makes NOVI the most local and well-studied shock powered transients. In the last decade or so, we've done a better job exploring the transient sky and we've discovered many new classes of diverse transients. Many of these are too luminous or evolve at the wrong rate to be explained by nuclear energy or radioactive energy, but, but they can be explained if there is a significant um, energy from shock interaction that is efficiently transformed into radiation and is powering their bolometric light curves. Such shock powered events are superluminous supernovae, fast blue optical transients, stellar mergers, and even tidal disruption events have been suggested as being shock powered. But for all those transients, they're all megaparsecs away and it is often difficult to prove that they are powered by shocks or to really study how that shock energy is transformed into radiation. So I believe that NOVI are really powerful and that they're the first case where we've been able to prove that the majority of the optical emission in a transient is powered by shocks. So finally, one more cool thing that we can do with shocks in NOVI. Another implication of NOVA shocks being dense and cool is that they may be excellent places to form dust. It has long been known that many NOVI show a dramatic dip in their optical light curve, which can be explained as a sudden episode of dust formation. So as seen here in this light curve of V1324-SCO, which exploded in 2012, this here is its dust dip. It's been a mystery how such dust forms in NOVI. 
as the ejecta are dropping in density and they're bathed by radiation from a hot white dwarf. So you might not think that nova ejecta are a very hospitable place to form dust, but they managed to do it. So people for a long time have sort of waved their hands and they've said, well, maybe it could be clumps in the ejecta. We're not sure. But Andrea Drudzinski in 2018 pointed out that if the shocks in Novi are cold and dense and radiated, then they might be excellent places to form dust. And I think one way to test that is with radio light curves. We obtained a multi-frequency radio light curve for this Nova, B1324 SCO, and we see that it shows two distinct maxima. The second maximum we think is thermal. So this is just from the expansion of the warm ejecta and is from that 10 to the 4K gas expanding. But the first maximum in the light curve, we, um, are, we model as being synchrotron emission, non-thermal emission. And again, so it writes synchrotron emission implies relativistic electrons and shocks. We see that in V1324 SCO, the dust minimum and the synchrotron maximum strikingly align in time. And I think that may be indication of a common origin, but I wasn't sure about this system. I thought maybe it was a coincidence. I wasn't ready to overinterpret it. Until I saw this system, the second NOVA, V357 MUS, which exploded in 2018. And it also showed a dust dip in its optical light curve and a double peaked radio light curve. Again, the dust dip is coincident with the synchrotron peak. And I think this has to be very strong evidence that the same shocks that produce the synchrotron emission are also producing the dust. And I think this has to have implications for how you might be able to form dust in other astrophysical transients like luminous red novae and supernovae and other shock powered observations or other shock powered objects. Okay, so uh, I feel like I might have gone through that quickly, but I will wrap up now. And I've taken you on a whirlwind tour of what we've learned about shocks and Novi and how our understanding of these garden variety explosions has really been turned on its head in the last decade. I've showed you that Novi can be energetically important and they can be the dominant source of the Nova's bolometric luminosity. These shocks can, can accelerate particles up to relativistic speeds all the way up to a TeV and beyond. The shocks can be cool and dense, which can mean that they are excellent places to form dust. <clears throat> and when we put all of this together, it means that Novi are a local representative of, our most local representatives of shock powered transients. And they provide nearby wonderful laboratories to better understand the diverse shock powered transients like type 2N supernovae, superluminous supernovae, and stellar emergers. And again, if you'd like to know more, I will point you at our annual review. And uh, sorry if I went a little bit fast, but thanks for your attention and I'll take questions. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I found that very interesting, uh, whatever speed it was. Um, yeah, <laughs> this was really neat because I was just thinking that um, it makes complete sense once you uh, put it out there. Like this is, you know, the shock model and things like that. And the fact that it's really only coming into more fruition now is really neat to see. Um, so I see one question from Jonathan. I, so um, I was trying to picture the geometry involved in the dust absorbing. Um, so then the dust would have to be being formed outside of this jet right where the shocks are. Um, so and that's, let me see. <laughs> we think that the dust is forming in the shocks. In the shocks, but um, okay. So the, but the, so the emission has to be interior to the dust where the dust is formed so it can be absorbed. Oh, oh, you're saying if this, it, so it's quite possible that by the time the dust is happening and absorbing significant optical luminosity, it's, it's not clear how long the optical light curve is shock powered for. 
So it's possible by those later times, by the time the dust starts to be important, the optical luminosity is no longer shock powered, but I'm not sure. Um, I guess, I mean, in Brian Metzger and A. Lod Steinberg's shock models, probably what they would say is that the dust and the optical emission are kind of coming from the same exact place. So they might be kind of intermixed in the shock front. That would be my best guess. They're pretty co-spatial. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think John's hand was up next. Uh, yeah, um, a lot of old Nova shells show a very knotty structure like DQ her or GK her, things like that. Mm -hmm. Would those knots be formed by instabilities in the pooling of these shocks or would they be pre-existing density and homogeneities formed during the, uh, formed by the wind of the original Nova? I think a lot would say that his, right? So our, the models that he makes get very corrugated and complex and I think would clump up. And so I think the shocks themselves might give you clumping in this sort of cold thin shells. Um, I don't know though. I think there might be multiple explanations for clumps in Novi. They look diverse to me. <laughs> and sometimes it looks to me like there, there was a, like if you look at some of the images in detail, there's a clump and then the clump has clearly been hit by something because it has like this cometary tail. Like it looks like a clump that got hit by a wind. So I think sometimes the clumps have to pre, like, yeah, have to pre-exist the shock. My guess is the mix. All right, uh, if that's it, uh, Daichi has a question. So yeah, thanks for the great talk. And you mentioned like, you know, some luminous transients like, you know, type two and supernovae. And mm -hmm. then one interesting class for, you know, could be the subpopulation of which is by CSM. And then, mm -hmm. and then like, you know, and then like, you know, I do some, you know, light gap modeling of, you know, type one CSM, and then some of them require like, you know, few solar masses of circumstellar material to explain that really bright light curves. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you have any, like, you know, a possible progenitor system in your mind. A possible what was last part? Progenitor system. Like, is it the common envelope or? Oh, for one ACSMs? Yeah. I am partial to the possibility that they are common envelope. And I would love to see this more thoroughly tested. I have a couple of projects to try to test that. But I think so. I think people for a long time have tried to explain all the type 1A CSMs as an RSO flake system. So a Nova system with a red giant companion. And I don't think there's enough circumstellar material in those cases. So I, I yes, I, I think it's more like a common envelope personally. Okay, yeah. Do you That's agree with I that? Too, so yeah. <laughs> sounds it sounds reasonable to me. <laughs> yeah, uh, Charles had a question. Laura, thanks very much. This is actually really fascinating. Um, so a dust dip in the optical would usually be accompanied by an infrared bump. Yes. Are there infrared observations of these? And is that actually what happens? Yes, it is. Um, so Oftentimes, yes. So in this particular case, this is like the, the I band light curve and the K band light curve is pretty flat during that big dramatic dust dip. I see. So it's, it's flat, it's not, not peaked. Sometimes you see a rise in the infrared and sometimes it just looks like kind of like it doesn't dip enough the infrared. You get sort of a, a mix of phenomenology depending. Okay, thank you. But almost always, they're all, but always the dip is much more dramatic in the optical than in the infrared. Okay. Well, that is consistent with it being dust, so. Yes, and we also see um, spectral features of dust forming in infrared spectroscopy around that time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Frederico. Hi, uh, thanks for this uh, fascinating presentation. Really encouraging to look at the review. Just a question about the, the very high density you said uh, uh, encountered by the shock. So you were showing something up to the 10, 
10 to the 10 per cubic centimeter. Mm -hmm. So is, uh, how is this related with the assumption that uh, uh, applying the DSA, you will need uh, a collision-less uh, shock? Is not the density uh, high enough that you can uh, approach the collisional regime so the particle-particle collision starts to be important? Or you are still very far from the regime because these densities uh, are really more than a billion times uh, larger than the, the ISM density. So, oh, that's a great question. I don't know the, off the top of my brain. I think they are still collisionless shocks, but I should get back to you on that. Uh, definitely, right? The magnetic field is what's mediating the particle acceleration, but. Uh, I should get back to you on that. I well, apologize. Uh, Follow-up question I had also. So what is the magnetic field you, you infer from the radio synchrotron about order of magnitude? I don't think I have that. I also don't have those numbers off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Great questions. No problem. Uh, yeah. I don't know off the top of my head. I'm sorry. No problem. But I can get back to you. M must be in the review. Right? Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. I'm just drawing for it. Like, yeah. Thanks. The answer is always in the radio. Uh, Rudy. Hi, Laura. That was Hi, an Rudy. excellent talk. Uh, thanks so much for giving that. Uh, I had a question about what you meant when you were talking about the model and you showed us that nice animation. Uh, you talked about the this later wind blown. Mm -hmm. By the, you said it was by reaccretion of material. Is that was that right? Oh, sorry, I continued um, burning on the white dwarf surface. So that okay, continued so fusion on the white dwarf surface is what's blowing the wind. Do you expect any delay in that from from the eruption to whenever that wind gets established? But you can imagine a world where the ejecta puff off, right, and maybe the outer parts of the ejecta form that equatorial torus. And then the rest of the material has to sort of settle back down or get expelled enough so that they're like they're, the wind, basically what happens is the wind launching radius changes where it is as the ejecta expand. And as the wind launching radius moves inward towards the white dwarf, that also leads to the wind picking up speed. So basically, you, one way to imagine it is it's a wind that where the velocity is being turned up over the course of the explosion. And so that's okay. why the later ejecta are going to be faster than the early ejecta and catch up with it and crash into it. So there's kind of a delay, kind of, in that way. I, it was, I just put a paper out on RSO from a, the 2006 eruption showing this bipolar ejecta. Ooh, and, uh, yes. And it, it was tempting to just say that it started at the explosion, but I, I left that as a free parameter in the modeling. And it does suggest like a delay, and but it's a very large error bar on that delay. We like, sometimes see evidence for like what looks like delayed ejections in Novi. And I think, I don't know, models also find that um, sometimes it's hard to eject the whole envelope depending on how much mixing there has been with the white dwarf. And so it's quite possible that in some cases the envelope puffs up and then it's just kind of marginally bound and it's kind of hanging around the system for a while and needs a final push to get removed. And I think in some cases we do see that. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, Brandon. Oh, sorry, I had to find the mute button. Um, so I, I want to ask very quickly about, um, well, I know you, I know you said you didn't have too many details on the TEV emission, um, but you had uh, sort of noted there that uh, you'd seen or detected, or HESA detected at least, things above 10 TEV. Um, I, I was curious, any idea or any uh, anything you can say about what that spectrum looks like, some sort of power law with um, what sort of index? Yeah, so I said, so particles up to 10 TeV, which would give you photons up to one TeV. It's kind of what I meant there. Oh, I see, okay. Yeah, so I, do, I, I know there from their HL, there's definitely emission at one TeV. I don't know how much further it goes. And their HL kind of implies that what they're seeing is just kind of like the high energy tail, and then it gets kind of cut off not too far into the Veritas band. So I don't think these are going to be like hard sources of a bunch of VHE photons. 
but who knows early days still but yeah i think it's in a lot of ways i think it's consistent with this sort of high energy tail all right great Thank i think you. we have oh sorry yeah uh, i think we have time if somebody still has uh one last burning question um for chance Well, no, Laura, it looks like you answered all of our questions about Novi, so that's excellent. Um, thanks again for a very nice talk. I think it's always great when you come to a talk like this and you learn that what you learned in school was not actually exactly maybe the right way that things happen. So, yeah, thanks. <laughs> so, thank you. Thanks for all your attention. Yeah, thanks very much for speaking to us. Okay, <laughs> take care.